This is take one of an interview with Elkie Balance Garish, and we're in her home in Ocracoke, North Carolina. Today is July 21st, and my name is Amy Glass. Um, Ms. Garish, I'd like to start out by asking you uh, when you were born. I was born January the 4th, 1915, in Ocracoke. And where, where was your home place where you were born? It was next door to Kenny Balance. He just visited there in his home. That my, my mother's home was the one next door to that one. On the, I could, there's no street, so I can't tell you exactly. It was next door to it? Was it behind it or next door, like if you're facing it to the It would left? be to the left if you're sitting on his porch. It would be to the left. Oh, uh huh. That house is still standing. Yes. And um, what were your parents' names? Elisha. Mm -hmm. And Emma Gaskin. Balance. And I wonder if you could think back to um, your memories of any memories you have of your grandparents. I remember. My grandmother Lois Balance. Mm -hmm. I, in fact, I was a teenager when she died. In fact, a older than that because it was the year I went in nurses' training. Mm -hmm. What do you remember doing with her? Well, there wasn't a whole lot of things to do. She was a very tiny lady, and uh, it always amazed me mornings. The first thing I would notice about her, I can remember that she washed her hair every morning and it was straight and in the middle and fixed in the back of her head. She was a cute little lady. In fact, I have a picture in there I can show you. And my grandfather, Mark Gaskin, I remember him. Mm -hmm. But that, I, that, I, my other grandparents were dead. Mm -hmm. So I could remember. Um, wash, if, if your grandmother washed her hair every day, that, was, that wasn't easy back then. You didn't just hop in the shower, did you? No, she washed it in a basin. That was one of the things I remember about her, and she was very neat and very attractive lady, mm -hmm. and she loved church work and visited. The people visited more then because they didn't have TV, radio, or anything. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing her going around to visit the neighbors early mornings and wonder, because she always got up real early. Uh -huh. um, what and what kind of memories do you have of your grandfather? Well. He was a tall, ruddy sort of a fella mm -hmm. that worked on the water most of his life and went on seagoing vessels. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't he, around a lot. He was traveling. Traveling, yes. Until his later, he had right many bad years toward the end of his life. He was sick right nuts. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, I don't remember my grandmother. He had a, I had a step grandmother, mm -hmm. and they had a little garden and had chickens and ducks and geese and things that most people here had then. Mm -hmm. And I remember going there with my mother most every day because I just lived in a house just a few doors back of us. Uh -huh. And they were very precious to me, both of them, my grandparents. Mm -hmm. Do you, did you ever tell you stories about being out at sea and seeing a storm or? Well, I can catch that up with my father because I heard more of that from my father than I did my grandfather. Okay, can you tell me that, about what your father was like? And well, his first wife died after they'd been married about six years and then he married my mother. He didn't have any children by the first wife. But before he married, mm -hmm. he, was, uh, he also went to sea. He went through the West India Islands and he fished off the Jersey coast and the uh, they went up in Maine on vessels, but I don't know what they went up there for. Probably lumber, huh? Lumber, yeah. Lumber. And they would bring, they would take things like, I think sometime I've heard him say they would take like things they had in the south, like molasses and different things on cargo ships. Mm -hmm. And he worked on the water until he and my mother was married at different times and then he decided he'd stay here and he, they had nine children two died 
I was the oldest one. There's two. I had a one sister and five brothers that lived. Let me ask, how, how, how do you know how your parents met one another? Well, they were neighbors. They're next door. Well, not exactly next door, but just close neighbors. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember he told me his first wife was a tiny little girl, and he married her. And they, his parents thought she lived on the other side of the lake. And apparently, they had never met her, didn't know who she was, or he didn't know the grandf my grandfather. Mm -hmm. And he said, Lois, there's a little girl out in the backyard. He said that, she said, that little girl is your uh, daughter-in-law. He said, well, ask her in for breakfast. So that's how he met her. <laughs> but my mother, he knew real well because she was in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And she was just a wonderful lady, my mother, when you have as many in-laws as she had that were very, they were all just crazy about her, mm -hmm. including my husband. She was a fine lady. Mm -hmm. And my father worked hard and worked on the water and stayed home with us, and they, we didn't have it easy during the Depression. Mm -hmm. But other than that, we fared all right. We owned our own home, and we, we always had a garden and his chickens, and. Mm -hmm. And what they did then, across the, over across that swamp quarter in that area, they had a lot of corn and beans and peas and meats that we didn't have over here. And my father would trade fish and clams and oysters for support. Mm -hmm. some of the things they had over there, like cornmeal. Mm -hmm. And that's how they survived on what they had. And he also had sheep at where the park has now. They used to have cattle, sheep, horses. And at one time, I remember, he had 80 head of sheep. So we ate lots of, m lots of lamb. You did. You're yeah. the first person to have said that. Not mm -hmm. too many people had sheep or ate. Well, a lot of them did at that time, but they just hadn't told you about it. Uh -huh. And they also had cattle down there. Uh -huh. In fact, as far back as when Irvin and I were married, we bought a cow, and she had a calf, but we never did see her anymore. <laughs> we never did know what happened to her. Probably the wintertime got her or something. Uh -huh. far, but and that's, uh, see, we had no refrigeration. What ice that we ever had got at all came over on the freight boat from Washington. And meats, what you had, you had to cook right away. Mm -hmm. And I remember they would raise the pigs, maybe a couple a year. My father used to have them maybe two. Mm -hmm. And would salt the meat for the winter, the hams and the pork and what have you. And, uh, well, it was just mostly chicken and what animals was raised here on the island. And what they did with the pork, a lot of times, if my mother, they killed their pigs, they divided with the neighbors, and the same thing happened the day they killed theirs. So that gave them different days that they'd have, and the neighbors all came in and helped make the sausage and the, the lard. And I was going to ask about that. I wonder if you could, I've never done that, and I don't know too much about it, and I wonder if you could describe what that, what would that scene have been like? If, I mean, if we could just walk right into that room right now where everybody was... Thinking. Well, it would be an iron cook stove to start with, and a big pot. They'd possibly have two or three pots. I remember the neighbors would bring in theirs, and they would cut up the fat out of the pig, mm -hmm. hogs, and whatever they had. And they would try this, and we had bay trees here. And I remember as a child going with my father to cut a bay stick. That's what they stirred the lard with. As they cooked it, they stirred it with the bay sticks, and they gave it some kind of flavor that they all liked. That was one of the reasons they used it. And then it was poured into tin, what they called tin lard cans. They were maybe they would hold five gallons. And that's how they preserved it for the winter time. And now they say cholesterol, no cholesterol, which I, you know, being a nurse, I know you're not supposed to have high cholesterol. 
that we were speaking about the other day. That was all those old people lived to be 80, 90, 100, 101, 117, 104. We've had them live that long here, and they used pure lard. That's all they had. But I think what the problem, or the, uh, the difference was, they were more active because they had to scrub their clothes on a board. They had to do everything with the broom sweeping. Mm -hmm. And they just were more active than the modern day lady. Well, going back to the, to the uh, making sausages, uh -huh. you take the lard and put that in. Well, well the sausage was made with the scraps of lean meat. Uh-huh. In uh, so some fat. Who, who actually cut up the... Uh -huh. My mother and father, who was killing, doing the hog killing that day, uh -huh. and the neighbors helped with it sometimes. It's according to how much they had, uh -huh. but they, you know, they make sausage out of some fat and some lean, and they grind it. We had a hand grinder that we used to put on the table, and my mother and father would grind the meat and then stuff. The, the intestines of the pig, they washed those and cleaned them real good and scrubbed them. I think they went through a lot of process, uh, different things uh, uh, to make them sanitary. Mm -hmm. Did they put any, was there any seasoning that went into the yeah. sausage? Yes, they had some seasoning, but sage, some used sage, but I don't think my parents liked the sage very well. They just used hot peppers and mm -hmm. salt and... Uh, I don't recall of any other kind. They probably didn't have much much different kind of seasoning at that time. Mm -hmm. um, was that a time that people looked forward to, kind of a, an event where lots of people in the community would come together and help out? You said some neighbors helped. Yes, and sometimes they would cook some of the meat and have lunch. Or the, the, the ladies would mm -hmm. uh, fix the lunch because the men... I think mostly after the men cut the meat up and took care of that part, the ladies did the rest, and the men went on about their work, whatever they were doing. Uh -huh. It would have been cold then. That would have been winter time. Well, right? it's usually it's, it was usually about November. Uh -huh. It would be cool weather anyway. It had to be cold enough so that the meat wouldn't spoil. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, I was going to ask about. Um, back up a little bit and ask about your dad. Um, he was a he did he was a fisherman on Okotoki Boss. He had worked on boats, freight boats, mm -hmm. and uh, what we I guess you would call them steamers. Mm -hmm. In the sound. Well, they, they would go to different localities, like as I told you, the West Indian Islands, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I asked him one time why they didn't go south more. He said because of the fever, and it was malaria later. I understood what it was. It, they had a lot of malaria at that time. They didn't have a lot of medication for it. Mm -hmm. And he said the men usually went north to work in preference to uh, mm -hmm. going to the south where it would have been more comfortable probably for them. Mm -hmm. But that was the reason. Did he tell you any of any stories about the West Indies? Or? Well, he had a bad accident on one of the boats one night. The, 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 the boom, something broke, and a block hit him in the head. And he always talked about that block that hit him in the head. He thought he was still having trouble from it, but he never really did. He never was sick much. But that was an accident he had somewhere at Sui. I don't know. He was very sick for a while. And... Uh, he also, as a teenage boy, was in the hurricane of 1899. Uh, they were down about somewhere near where the campground is. There was two older men and two young boys, I believe. Mm -hmm. He was one of the younger boys. And they stayed three days and nights on the top of the hill in a small boat because they couldn't get to the village. And when the wind subsided and the water, of course, started to ebb away, he walked home. And he said sometimes that the water was 
so deep he'd have to swim across the gullies and places that the water was deep. And when he got home, his mother, which lived right at the house that you were visiting today, Kenny's, that's where her, her older home was, her older home was. He walked in the kitchen, which was built away from the house, to get something to eat because he was so hungry. And the mud from the lake at that time, it was clean now, but then it was muddy. has been dragged since then. It was so deep on the floor that he slipped and fainted, and there was nobody home. So when he got himself together, he went over to a neighbor's, and that's where they all were. It was on a hill. They had all gone over there, and they said there was hardly any home on Ocracoke that wasn't submerged in water. But um, he was telling me how good the lady's biscuits were that morning and her, hot, and her hot coffee that she had for him when he got there. But they didn't have anything like we have now without lights or things. They uh -huh. just had mm -hmm. just regular wood stoves to cook on. And so that wasn't much of a hardship at that time for them. Um. Was your, uh, so after your, after he came back from his travels on fishing boats, he married your mother and then raised a family. And when he was raising a family, he worked mainly as a... Anything he could do. Anything he could do. He did some carpenter work. He, he worked on the water. Uh-huh. Uh, when they built some of the, some of the first motels, he helped build mm -hmm. some of those, he helped the carpenters. Uh just any kind of job that came available at that time. Would you say his work was based on the se on seasonal kinds of things? Well, the, in the winter time he would do certain work and then spring or summer he would do other kinds? Well, it was according to the weather and what jobs there was available at the time. In spring it would be crabbing maybe. And in the winter time it would be oyster and summer it would be clamming and fishing. And he fished a lot at night. They used to go what they call mullet fishing and he would go fishing at night. So we always had plenty of seafood. Mm -hmm. and that's one of the things we had plenty of, and now mm -hmm. a lot of times we can't even hardly get it here. Yeah. Oysters. Um, do you, were you going to say something? Sorry. I said the oysters, would be, you know, this year the red tide, and they, they spoiled our oysters, but uh, I can remember we always had oysters in the wintertime unless the weather was real bad. Mm. I was going to ask you about some of the foods that your mother prepared, m maybe you helped her prepare, um, how would you say, say oysters, how do you eat those? Well, for, I'll start with breakfast. Okay. She usually fixed us a, a pot of hot oatmeal and maybe scramble some eggs or boil or fry eggs. And as I said, sometimes we would have some kind of meat with her for breakfast, but not always. Mm -hmm. And for, for lunch, he cooked a lot of clams because the boys all particularly like clam chowder. How would she fix clam chowder? Well, you would probably call it a soup, but I call it a chowder, but you chop the clams and save the broth and put them on to cook them with, uh, with the broth mm -hmm. after you strain that. Potatoes and onions. And some people use a little bit of cornmeal to thicken the chowder just a little bit. And I know my mother always did use a little bit of salt pork and fried it out like a, and, and added that to it. It keeps it from being so bland. Mm -hmm. And you cook it for about an hour and a half or two hours. Actually, if you let it simmer, it's better. Mm -hmm. And oysters, we had them, most of us liked ours a little better than the other way. But we would have them fried and greens and oyster stew was fixed just about like the clams, except you didn't put potatoes in it. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we had scallops. I remember one year that they were so plentiful that my grandmother and my aunt and the neighbors would open the scallops through the day as the men would catch them, they're so plentiful. They come in, sort of they come in different seasons, I think, mm -hmm. uh, different years. And some years you may not see them, and next year you may have plenty of them. I think last year, year before last, they had lots of them. Mm -hmm. Year before last. And they were cooked just fried in batter cakes or 
fried single if they were large enough. And uh, my mother always cooked her own bread. She would have hot bread for breakfast, biscuits, mm -hmm. and then for lunch she fixed cornbread because most of the time we would have seafood with that. And she made rolls most days mm -hmm. because she had to cook a lot of bread because it's a lot to eat the boys, you know, they'd be working hard too. And uh, mm -hmm. she, she made bread, cooked bread about three times a day, really. When she made her biscuits, did she have a long pen that she used? Well, she usually mixed hers up with a spoon or something with her hand. Uh -huh. She didn't roll hers out. She just made hers out with her hand. Oh, she, so she even formed them? Form, made her own rolls, yeah, that way, instead of making it with, uh, with a rolling pen. Mm -hmm. And she, my mother was crazy about sweets. And... Uh, she would always have something. She'd try to make something if it was a rice pudding or a custard or something, and she would, whenever she could, she'd fix us with dessert too. Mm -hmm. We didn't have it all the time, but whenever she could, she was, like, my brother's always talking about nobody could make a rice pudding like my mother could. Wait, how did she make rice pudding? Do I can't tell you. I'm not sure. I know she used eggs and sugar and, and yeah. raisins and... Uh, well, just boil the rice and add the sugar and the milk and the eggs and flavoring of whatever kind. And some people put pineapple in it. Mm -hmm. But she just made hers mostly with, she liked lemon flavor. Mm -hmm. What about fruit? Did you have much fruit here? We didn't have a lot of fruit. Because, see, as I told you, it had to come over on a freight boat. In the wintertime, we would get oranges and apples. But in the, and in the summer, there was a few people had a, there was a few apple trees and a few peach trees. My father had some right nice peach trees at one time. But the storms would come along and destroy them. Mm -hmm. And then we, he had grapevines, mm -hmm. uh, scuppering on grapes. But fruit was a, a sort of a, a scarce item here. Mm -hmm. It had to be imported. Mm -hmm. Did you ever do anything with the grapes? Or did your mom um, can those or put those up in? No, in most of us ate those because they wouldn't have that many of them. Uh -huh. Now we had lots of blackberries that grew here. My mother made blackberry preserves. Oh, she did. Or jelly. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was one of the desserts they'd have a lot of blackberry dumplings mm -hmm. or blackberry pie. Mm -hmm. But that was. I know my father always liked to go black through the woods with blackberry, and there was lots of them at that time. Where, where, where could you get blackberries? They just grew wild here. I mean, was there a wooded an area? Yes, honey. Wooded? Before it was, before it was. <laughs> <laughs> was it back behind your house? Back behind the house, yeah. And there was some back of my house up until last year. I gave my grandson mm -hmm. a piece of land that cleared it out, but. They go, they go real good here. Um, can you tell, do you remember any special foods that were prepared during holidays? Well, uh, they raised a lot of sweet potatoes here on the island. They'd make a lot of sweet potato pies. And uh, there was one little boy that said left Ocracoke one time to ask him what kind of pie he wanted. He said, well, they didn't know there was any kind except tater pie. <laughs> it was real cute, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> They made lemon pies. They made different kinds, according to what you had, coconut or whatever you had, they made them. And uh, there was a few people that made fruitcakes. Oh. In fact, I made fruitcakes up until about two or three years ago. Every year since I've been married, I made my own. And did you ever have a goose that you Yes, wildfowl was plentiful at that time, and we had, uh, my mother cooked a lot of wildfowl because my father would go hunting and the boys would. Mm -hmm. uh, they were a lot better shaped than they are nowadays. I guess this is what the feed they get is probably, some of it may be contaminated now mm -hmm. or something, but we had a lot of good wildfowl at that time. Mm -hmm.
And how did your mother prepare the, the fowl? She used the bait that our stewed it. Was it stewed with other vegetables? No, she just usually made hers with potatoes and uh, sometimes she add pastry. Sounds good. Well. Um, did, w did you ever have wine for, uh, as a special, for special occasions? Some people made it out of blackberry wine and grapes. We had a lot of, at times we had wild grapes and some people would make wine out of that. Mm -hmm. I know the neighbor that lived back of us was an older lady and whenever we were sick, we were small, we didn't have medicines. Very little medicine was on Okokok at that time. And if it was, she would always have a little blackberry wine that mm -hmm. she'd bring over for certain things. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Did she make it? Yes, they would make it. Um, were you, as the oldest in your family, did you take care of your younger brothers and sisters as they were coming along? Yes, and another thing, as I grew older, when the children were born, I would have to stay home from school to help my mother, because back then they, they didn't let you get out of bed like they do now. They kept in bed nine days or eight, nine days, mm -hmm. and they were, were not allowed to do much of anything. My mother did more than she should have done, I'm sure, but I remember having to take care of the, the younger ones and helping her. Mm -hmm. What was it like around the house when you had a new brother or sister? Well, we had midwives. I was the only one that was delivered by the doctor. There was one here visiting us at a summer cottage or something, and he was with the midwife that delivered me. But the rest of my mother didn't want him. She, my father went after him anyway, but she, she didn't want a doctor. She wanted a midwife. But anyway, we had two, we had the best one that was ever was born. I reckon that lady, she was a really a good one. Who was that? She was Mrs. Charlotte O'Neill. Mm -hmm. And I know she delivered many, many babies. Mm -hmm. And I don't think she ever lost but two mothers, and that was a complication from pneumonia or something. Mm -hmm. Of course, there was some earlier midwives. Mm -hmm. uh, but Do I don't know? remember them. Uh -huh. how, how did Miss Charlotte O'Neill get her training? Did, would it have been, did she learn from her mother? For, well, from, yes, I think it was either her mother or her aunt. Somebody in the family was a midwife before her. Uh -huh. And uh, I, it used to amaze me. She would, uh, we, we would have like a tin heater, you know what I'm talking about, that burns wood. You've never seen one. Well, they had those to heat the house with. And she would take little pieces of cloth and scorch it and use a big raisin to put on the navel, oh. the, the, the cord. Uh -huh. and yes, I, she's here, but she is busy right now. Who is this, Henry? Oh, no. And scorch it on the stove. Uh -huh. And she'd use this big seedless raisin to put on the navel cord, where it was supposed to drop off in after so many uh -huh. days. And I was often wondered what it was for. And when I went in nurse's training, I wanted many times to ask somebody, but I was embarrassed because I you know, didn't know what they might answer I would get. But then it dawned on me that it was for a, a sanitary purposes. The scorched cloth was the same thing if you used it in an autoclave. It was scorched clean, and the raisin had the drying effect. As the raisin dried, the cord dried along with it, but that's what she used. And she never had any infections, and the babies all were real healthy. And many of them survived an overcoat that she delivered. Now, she's the one I knew the best. Then, of course, there was others. There was a graduate nurse that came here, a local girl that delivered babies after that. Did you, when you were, were you curious about, about midwifery when you were a young girl? I wanted to be a nurse, but I never particularly thought about being a midwife. Uh, I did, after I came back to Okokoks, sometimes I would get caught here and I would deliver babies. 
but uh, I never, I didn't do it as a profession. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would want to have done that for uh, an everyday thing. Mm -hmm. Now this other nurse that came back delivered right many babies. Who was she? she? Well, I guess I can use her name. It was Kathleen Bragg. Mm -hmm. And so she was, she had gone off and gotten some training. training. She was a local person who had gone off to That's right. get training. She and was an RN. She graduated from a uh, hospital in Parkview in Rocky Ninth, I believe is where she trained. I'm not positive that, uh -huh. but I think that's where it was. Uh -huh. And uh, she, of course, when I moved back home to stay, she was getting older then, and uh, I would help her with things, and she would help me. I see. But, um... She did a good job here. She really did, and uh, I think the island was blessed in having her. Mm -hmm. What, um, getting back to um, Miss O'Neill and, and her work as a midwife, what other kinds of things did she do um, uh, when a baby, either was a baby was about to be born? What kind? What was what was that like? Was was the labor difficult, and how did she help? The it's sort of like the Lamas that they have nowadays, natural childbirth. I never did see one born that my mother had because I was never allowed in, you know, I was young. Mm -hmm. My mother was a very private person. But, um, was the midwife the only person in the room with your mother? Unless it was my grandmother or somebody might have been it at your times. Mother? No, her, her, the my sister. father's mother. Right. Her mother died when she was only six. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to me because it seemed like that being on an island um, and not having any of the technology that we have that seems to be so important now that, that so many ba babies were born and they were born successfully. A lady came by not too many years, two, three years ago and said to me, she said, could I ask you a question? And I said, yes, if I could answer it, I will. She said, was babies ever born on this island? I said, lady. We had only sailboats that was in here at the time, little boats, sailboats. There was no way in the world you could get them hardly to the mainland to have a baby born. It would have to be born at Ocracoke. And I said there was, we had children that died the years before I could remember that was like from diphtheria and things of that kind, but that was all over the whole country because they didn't have inoculations and things to give the children that we have now, vaccines. Do you remember any, were there epidemics in, that you can remember in your life? Nothing more than just the flu epidemic and a few children died with different things like colitis. That was very prevalent when I went in nurses training. A lot of babies died with that. Mm -hmm. uh, my second year in nursing, I believe, we had, they had an epidemic in North Carolina and it was very bad. Uh, the doctors would try to give them IV solutions. I know the doctors in Raleigh that I would help. Mm -hmm. Some of them they say, but a lot of them died. Mm -hmm. That was back yeah. in 30, let's see, 38. It was the year of about 19 and 36 and 37. This is tape two. Um, could you just explain to me how you, how you got into the nursing profession? We didn't have a high school here when I first grew up. And I went to school over at Hatteras one year and stayed with my uncle. Then I went to Washington at a boarding school for one year, Washington, North Carolina. And I really wanted to go to college, but I graduated in 1932, and that was right at the height of the Depression. So my second, I had always thought I would like to be a nurse, and I had lots of material that I had ordered from places. Uh, but book? Books, like from Chicago School of Nursing. Uh -huh. And um, I would read about it. But anyway, I I had to work three years after I got out of high school before I could raise enough money to go. It didn't cost much, but dollars were short, very few at that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I went to Raleigh and my mother said, ride the train. It's she thought that was safer, so 
there was a train that went over the water at Beaufort to go to Moorhead, and I thought, never again will I get on a train. I had never been on anything like that. What was it like? Well, it was scary because there's over water, you know how trains train is. <laughs> I think I'd be frightened now. But anyway, we got in, we had to go into Goldsboro, and I believe we changed there, I believe we did. But I met a, a boy on the bus or on the train that was going to Raleigh to State College, and later his friend, who lives in, his sister, who lives in Beaufort now, turned out to be one of my best friends. She was in nurses training with me as a younger student. But anyway, I got into Raleigh late at night, and his aunt met me and took me to her house till the next morning. And then I, uh, my husband's aunt, oh, uh -huh. she lived in Raleigh at the time, and she... You weren't married at that time? No, no, oh, okay. uh-uh. And, uh, of course, that was an experience, too. Uh, so many things that those girls took for granted, I didn't know about because it was, I hadn't been thrown with electrical things. We didn't have electricity at that time. So that was the first time you had other than no. When I went to boarding school in Washington, they had electricity over there, but that's the only. The, but anyway, I don't think anybody ever enjoyed anything any more than I did my three years of nursing. It was really hard at that time because twelve-hour duty and uh, you didn't have maids to do the scrubbing or the things that you have nowadays that have higher help. But I enjoyed it very much. And after I finished training, I didn't get home at Christmas time, but once during the whole three years. I did have a two weeks vacation a year. And that was that was nice being able to come home in the summertime. Mm -hmm. But uh, did anyone from from your family here visit you in Raleigh? They came from a graduation my aunt and my brother. And there was another, Thurston Gaskell's, uh, had, they had a, a lady, a girl they took as a child, and she went in nurses training with me too, but she left and got married before she finished her school. But she was a real good nurse, and she's died recently. And she helped out a lot on Ocracoke, really did a lot of work in the community. Who was she? She was Elizabeth Gaskins Howard. Um, I wonder if you could describe a little bit for me what it was like to be in um, in a new place like Raleigh, which I imagine was more of a city. What kinds of things, you said it was very different and you weren't used to the things that they took for granted. What, besides electricity, what other kinds of things were, did, did well, they have there that you felt like you did have here? Paved roads, uh, theaters, movie theaters. We had silent ones here when I first grew up, but that's, we didn't have any, any, uh, sound, sound. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the worst thing I encountered was the first winter I was there, we had about seven snowstorms, and we had to go from the nurse's home to the hospital morning, and we always had to be rushed, and I would slip down because I had never been used to ice and snow, uh -huh. and I, I, my knees stayed sore most of the whole winter. <laughs> <laughs> Did you but, have enough clothing to be prepared for that kind of cold? Yes, we, I had, we, it wasn't really that bad. We had winter coats and uh -huh. And I know we had a nurse's home across the street. It was which now is the right across Fable Street. Mm -hmm. And we'd go, uh, we'd get off of duty at night. We had a night nurse's home across there that we used to sleep in the daytime. Mm -hmm. And we would get dressed, get our shower, and mm -hmm. put on our pajamas and go put our coat on across the street to go to this house that wasn't heated. They said we would sleep better if it was cold, mm -hmm. which we did, I'm sure. And we would sleep till one or two o'clock. Then we had to get up and go to class. That sounds pretty rough. Rough. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Um, 
Did you ever go home with any of the, of the girls yes. who went to their homes in other parts of the state? I went to Salisbury or Lexington, and I had Christmas dinner with one of my friends. I believe it was the Coble Daily home. And I remember they had frozen Santa Clauses for dessert. I had never seen anything like that. They had pheasants, which was pre uh, plentiful up at that area, I guess. Mm -hmm. Then another time I would go, like near Raleigh places, like uh, the nurses that lived nearby, I would go home for a day or something. Mm -hmm. They were always real nice about asking me to go. Did you correspond with, with letters to your family here? Every week. No way you couldn't telephone then. We didn't have any phones at Oak Coast except the Coast Guard station and the lighthouse, I believe. Did you always, when you were there, did you feel, did you know that you were going to return to Ocracoke, or did you ever feel like you were, you wanted to stay in Raleigh or move somewhere else now that you were in the big world? I like Raleigh but as well as any place I've ever lived, really. Uh, and I never really thought about coming back. I never gave it much thought. I had lost a brother, a little brother, with this colitis epidemic that you're talking about, following the storm of 1933. And I think that encouraged me more to go in nurses' training because I wanted to know more about it, medicine and things. So you were here for that storm? Yes, I've been here several storms. And, uh, and then you went off to nurses college in what yeah. year was that? 1935. Okay. And I graduated in 1938. Okay. 50 years this year we have our nurses reunion in Raleigh. Really? We have it every other year and this is the 50th year for my class and I believe all my class are living except three. I think there's 23 of us and I think all are living except three. Mm -hmm. So did you, when you graduated, did you have a degree then? Well, it's a uh, uh, nursing diploma. Mm -hmm. It's a three-year course. It's, a, it's an RN. Mm -hmm. um, you said you didn't think much about coming back here. But what made you come back after you graduated? Well, I didn't. I oh, worked away. Yeah. After I earned our married that year in 1938, and he was in service, and I worked at Norfolk General. I worked in a lot of different hospitals, and the last place I worked was in Wilmington, Delaware. I worked in the recovery room for seven years. Mm -hmm. And then he came here as captain of the Cedar Island Ferry mm -hmm. on the boats. Mm -hmm. And I worked over at sea level for a couple of weeks when he was tied up over there. And then I came back here the other two weeks in the month. Every other week I worked over at sea level. But I just did that because the girls are married, and uh, I was alone here. Mm -hmm. um, so you met, you met your husband then? No. No. His mother died when he was two and a half, and his mother was from Raleigh. But uh, she, his grandmother reared him in this house after she died. So we went to school together all the many years. And then we, he was working in Raleigh at the time that I was in nursery training because his grandparents lived there, a grandmother. And um, that's how we knew each other all our lives, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, getting back to, back to um, Uncle Coke when you were a young person, um, what was, we, we talked about how, about childbirth, but I was wondering about what, what would happen if someone got sick? What kinds of options were available to um, take care of you? Say if you had a something fairly mild, like a cold or... My mother. The mothers took care of the children and sometimes the grandparents would come in with some kind of a remedy. But I don't recall of ever seeing very few medicines of any kind in our home. My mother never did give us much patent medicine. What did she use? Well, she would use aspirin if they had aspirin. And that's about all. She didn't give us a lot of drugs mm -hmm. of any kind. A lot of people tried out different things, you know, for 
flu and different stuff, but she never did give us much of that. Mm -hmm. And I guess, too, it was a problem of getting the money to buy stuff with then. And we had no drugstore, and we had a doctor that came here, and he had one kind of pills that he dished out, those little pink pills, and they'd make us all sick. <laughs> I remember. What were they for? I don't know. He gave them for anything, didn't he? Whatever. <laughs> One pill for everything. <laughs> All I ever remember seeing was a pink pill. And they, it was flavored with wintergreen, and you won't find many ochre coat boys and girls who want anything with wintergreen in it. I think it had a little calomel in it, and that's a very dangerous drug, you know. But what is that? Calomel. Calomel? C-A-L-O-M-E-L. And I never see that given uh -huh. anywhere in the hospitals that I ever worked, but mm -hmm. they, I've heard that's what mm -hmm. was in it. But. Um, well, what kinds, if your mother didn't have patent medicine, what kinds of things did she use to treat illnesses? Well, she'd bathe us if we had a high, high fever and cool water with ice if she had it. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I said, I don't remember her giving us any medicine. Did she have any kind of preparations that she no. made or anything? No, she didn't. Some of the older people, the older than she was, might have made things, but I've never seen any of it. Oh, you didn't? Was there much in the way of preventive medicine? Like, did she ever talk about, you know, if you ate certain foods, then you wouldn't get sick? Or That's right. And particularly the older people, they thought oysters and sweets would make you sick, and uh, some people wouldn't hate, drink milk wouldn't with drink. fish if they had fish. But when I went in nurses' training, I learned different. They said any food that was fresh wouldn't hurt you if you're eating it together. Mm -hmm. So I learned that from that much anyway. Mm -hmm. Must have been hard to keep things fresh, particularly without refrigeration. Well, it, it was, but it, they cook fresh foods every day. Mm -hmm. I once worked with a girl from Iran, and she told me that that's what it was. She said she couldn't get used to refrigerating anything mm -hmm. because where she lived, they cook the food fresh every day. I said, it was sort of where I live, too. Mm -hmm. It's the same mm -hmm. situation, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I wanted to ask you about... Um, you mentioned the 1933 storm, mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about what's about storms here on the Isles. I'm sure you've lived through your share of them. Well, the 33, the 99, 1899, was supposed to be the worst one. Then they said the 44 storm came along, but I wasn't living here then. I was living in Newburn. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was the one that did an awful lot of damage on Oak Cook, and the 1933 storm followed the one we'd had the week before. We the had two right together. together. They came right together. Uh -huh. And I remember we had large, right good size oak trees in our yard that was uprooted in that. Mm. And the water would come into houses because it seems like then they didn't build the houses like they do now high. They were built mostly well on account of the winds. The old people thought that they would get wind damage if the houses were built too high. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, this house I'm living in now is 100 years old this year. Mm -hmm. And I think his grandmother told me the water had only been in this house twice. Once. Once. Mm -hmm. 44. 44 storm. Is this and we've raised it. Up on no, we've raised it. It's a lot, a lot is low, and mm -hmm. we've raised it up where we don't think it'll come in it again. Hopefully. Mm -hmm. well, what was that 33 storm like for you? Did your family all stay together in one room, or what was that? No, a Micah aunt had a new house, the one that you were just visiting over to Kenny's. Uh -huh. That was her new house, and of course that's a low house. It's sort of a bungalow, uh -huh. and our house was tall tall on that and we my father and mother would take the children and go over there because my grandmother and my aunt lived there alone mm -hmm. and in case you know something the window broke or something 
but always in a storm. And I used to dread it for that reason. I didn't like to leave home to go anywhere. It's the uh, spend the night. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that's that's one of the bad ones. And the forty-four. And then there was one summer. It was in the fifties. I don't know, just around fifty-four or something. I was here, and I lived in this house next door. That was ours too. It was ours. And the tide came up to my door sill three different times in the storm, but it never did come inside. It just came to the door. And, but that was, those were not as bad as mm -hmm. some of the others. And we've had several since we've been back to Ocracoke in 20 years, but they've not been bad ones. Did you leave the island for any of these? Only one before? time. The one time, that was about three years ago, four years ago. Gloria. The one they said was going to be so bad. Uh huh. And uh, we went happen? to Greenville. We were the last on the last boat that went out of here, and the first one that came back. We all went and took our cats, mm -hmm. my daughters, and we all went. But mm -hmm. I didn't want to go, but they wanted me to go, so I went. But I'm not afraid to stay in a storm because I've weathered them before. Mm -hmm. Um. Did you ever? What kind of, did you take any special precautions before the storm? Or was there anything you did, like, out in the yard or in the house? Well, we secure everything as best we can. Mm -hmm. And if you have lawn mowers or anything that you might get salt water into, you mm -hmm. uh, put those uh, somewhere in the safe place. And uh, some people have shutters that they put on, but we don't have any, uh, not uh, that close. And uh, we put our storm windows down. And secure things that like in the flying objects that might be on the porch or anything that might blow in the hard wind. Mm -hmm. um, after the storm, what would happen? What would you do afterward? Well, it's always a mess to clean up the tree branches. And I think this the one that we had that was so bad since we've been home, we had about 20, 15 or 20 truckloads of stuff we had to haul out where the limbs broke and sound under a lot of trees here. We had a lot lot of debris that washed up from the lake that came up to see this hill over here is high and the tide doesn't come over that mm -hmm. but the what this it brought the debris up to the edge of that and i had it all clean up where did you where do you haul things to we had a place in that we could put branches with uh -huh. the we have a sanitary uh, uh district here and we, and we also have a garbage truck that takes out the stuff to, uh, I think they take it up to East Lake or somewhere there. It's where ours is taken. It's off the island anywhere. Uh, that's another thing I, I had meant to ask about in the old days. What would people do about garbage? They burned it and, and gave it to the chickens, all the scraps. And the food you had left was given to the chickens or the pigs if they had uh, those. And, uh, they burnt, uh, buried the cans and burned the paper. Didn't have a lot of paper like we have now. Didn't get that advertisement so we get every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. They just burn it out in the open, or did they? Burn they it have a barrel, barrel or something in the back that they burn it. Mm -hmm. Wasn't mm -hmm. whole. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, you also mentioned a little earlier that the depression had a, you said it had a very difficult, a very bad effect on, on the village. And I wonder if you could tell me what, what that was like. What, what kinds of things were affected? Well, Oakcoke was one of the last places to feel the depression. It had hit everywhere else before it really hit us. Most everybody on the island owns their own home. As I said, they. You could get food some kind of way here because you could get it from the water, or you could you could get vegetables and raise your own vegetables and things here. And I, as I said, there was not much money made on Overcook at that time anyway. There was the Coast Guard that had some employees and the lighthouse keeper and the, some stores. But the majority of the people had to go off the island to work. Mm -hmm. Now, that was bad because a lot of them, they had work on the mainland, had to come back home because they lose their jobs. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and it was actually the last place to come out of the, uh, the depression 
it hit us last and we're about the last to leave. They started the, the WPA, you know, that helped I, and the different projects that our good President Roosevelt had. That was uh, helped the people here a lot. But I don't, there was nobody I don't think went hungry here. I don't think that. Mm -hmm. Cause it was just, you had the staples, the groceries to buy, but the rest of the things you could get from the land mm -hmm. and the water. You were, you were very fortunate in that sense. You had the natural And the, had lots of wood here then. See, they had a lot of land that wasn't cleared, and nobody said a word if you went to get your wood. And the freight boats brought in wood, too, if you could afford to buy it. Mm -hmm. And I remember going to school. We had a pot belly stove in the, the room that I was in, and a lot of mornings we would have to go out and get brush and things to make the fire. Mm -hmm. And at one time, the county ran out of money to buy the coal. So we just used wood or whatever we could get to heat with. But we always had real nice teachers that would let us sit around the stove. Mm -hmm. But that was during the Depression and uh, some years before that. Yeah. Um, I haven't heard too many stories about going to school. I know there was a school here and, uh, and all, but I wonder if you could describe what, the, what your classes were like in school here on Uncle Coke? Well, I started school when I was five. I would have been five the fourth day of January, so I started a year early, the earlier. I could go early because my birthday was on the fourth. Mm -hmm. And I remember having a teacher that taught me that hadn't even been, I don't know that she even had a high school education, first lady that taught me, but uh, my mother had already taught me my numbers and my ABCs and those things before I went to school. And we went a full, I guess, six, seven hours mm -hmm. of class. And we, the second year, I had a, t a t teacher that had been to college, the second grade. And uh, we always could go home for lunch. We didn't have to worry about buying lunches or anything. Mm -hmm. We could go home, and uh, we always had nice teachers, and, and we had a good school for it to be a small school. Mm -hmm. And we got the first high school in 1931. That was the first year that we had a high school at Oak Cove. And did you go to that high Yes, school? I graduated from here uh -huh. in 1932. So you had gone... You said you went off and, and boarded. See, they didn't have us. Uh, they only had to the eighth grade. Uh -huh. So from the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth, and we only had eleven grades. Mm -hmm. And so, w did you? Did any of the other? Um, did your brothers and sisters go off at the same time to board and, and attend school? No, some of them dropped out and went back when they got to high school. Several finished in my class that had gone back to school that was older than me, three or four years older. Mm -hmm. But we didn't have, uh, well, we just didn't have many students at, th at that time to start with. We had uh, maybe 50 or 60 students. Mm -hmm. At the class I graduated in, I think there was 11. In Heath Irving's class, I think there was 10. So there wasn't many students, but yet we had a good school. We had maybe three or four for high school teachers. Mm -hmm. Were there school um, games or sports or anything of that nature? In they played baseball, and sometimes they had, I think, a volleyball. I would see them have volleyball. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would have maybe a 15 minutes recess, but most of the time what exercise we got was after we were out of school. Mm -hmm. We didn't have many. We didn't have a playground like they have now. Right. Not one that was with yeah. swings and things like the children have now playing. Mm -hmm. Did um what sort of recreational activities did you did you have when you were younger? Um I guess there weren't as many store bought toys around. What sort of toys did you have to play with? Well, we would have dolls and 
my father would usually make us a cart of some kind that we could play with, sort of like a wagon. Mm -hmm. And he'd make that for us. He'd make the boys cross through an arrow mm -hmm. to shoot birds. <laughs> and we had, as teenagers, we had two ice cream shops, one for each church, and the different girls served the ice cream and sold it for the church. And we had two dance halls, mm -hmm. and we had lots of square dancing at that time. That's what the teenagers mostly did. If the parents would let you go, sometimes we'd have a hard time convincing them to let us go. But mm -hmm. Did you get to go to some square dances? Oh, yes, I used to go. And were those mostly the local musicians who played at the yes, square dances? Yes, most of the time. Sometime in the summer months, uh, Thurston Gaskell's father had a place down over the water. He used to have a couple of men from Washington that came over and played mm -hmm. saxophone and and uh, guitar or something. Uh -huh. But we had s s local musicians too, mm -hmm. like Morris and Edgar. Did they? Um, did you ever learn any new dances there um, when you would go to the dance halls? No, but when I went in nurses training. There was uh, several dances that we used to go to that they would have different kinds of dances, the jitterbug, and uh, mm -hmm. there was one they called the Black Bottom. I don't know, just remember how it went, but that was one of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, back then, if you had, well, they gave us a dance at the hospital, they'd have an orchestra most of the time, and that would be mm -hmm. music like the guy Lombardo music mm -hmm. and that type of music, mm -hmm. but that wasn't what we had at Overcoat, anything like it. Uh-huh. Do people dress up for square dances? Well, we wore good clothes when we went, but we didn't ha wear costumes like they have, you, like you see in pictures of square dances. So we just wore whatever kind of summer dress we had. Oh. You've lived here for most of your life. You've moved away mm -hmm. for a while, but then eventually you came back. And I just wonder if you could tell me in your in your eyes what are some of the the biggest changes in the in the area that you've seen um, over the years. I think it's in the people. Mm -hmm. Used to we were closer because. We didn't have the confusion that we have now. I'll call it confusion because that's what it is really when it gets crowded like it is now. You, do, you don't visit like you did before. Even families don't visit each other like they used to. I think I miss that, the congeniality among the people more than anything else. When the, when the tourists aren't here during this you know, off season, is there, do people visit more? Well, we had more local activities going on, like through the church and the school. There's, uh, that's uh, mm -hmm. one thing that we have in the winter months that we don't have in the summer. Mm -hmm. and a lot of people complain about the tourists, so they don't bother me, because I enjoy people to stop and talk, but sometimes if you live at the beach, you know, you do have more company than you have uh, any other place you live. When you were growing up, I'd, I wonder, I mean, would you ever have anticipated that that there w that this would have been a popular kind of resort, the sort of resort area that it's becoming? Well, we always, it always was a resort as far back as I can remember, because in the summertime we had lots of people that quite a few that had summer cottages here. Uh -huh. And we always had tourists that come in on freight boats or on passenger boats or what have you. But you see, when they put the roads in, that made it more accessible to the rest of the world. Uh -huh. And more people came in because mm -hmm. they had a way to get in here. And just think of ferries. I heard my son-in-law say one day last week they hauled on one ferry, not, uh, or the ferries hauled 1,900 cars that day. That was coming from Hatteras. 
So you can see what an influx of people we had now is compared to what it used to be. On the 4th of July, we would have a dance, and there would be right many people. But there's more goes by this road any day now than would probably be on the island as visitors at that time. I believe that. We had a few grocery stores, and they sold dress material, and the mothers made the clothes. Uh, they, we had two churches. Mm -hmm. Actually, it ended up, at one time we only had one church until the Assembly of God came in here, because the two United the church, the Methodist church is united. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we just had that, and uh, I don't know. Uh, as far as the, the the activity now, there's not as much really for the young people as rec for recreation other than the beach as we had when I grew up. And you certainly aren't any dance halls. Not anything. Yeah. No movie theater. We did have a theater later on. We had a theater. Mm -hmm. And uh, showed mu they had movies maybe twice a week mm -hmm. or something like that. But there's nothing here now, absolutely nothing except the kids all work. They all have jobs, which you didn't have when I grew up, so it's one thing or the other. Well, um, I don't have any more questions right now. Is, is there anything else that you wanted, that you feel is important to say, or that you feel Well, it's still say? one of the best places to visit. The beach, we have one of the nicest beaches anywhere. And uh, the, 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 even though the lake is getting built up mm -hmm. with motels and what have you, it's still one of the prettiest harbors anywhere. Mm 